this it? It's kind of funny how often we have problems with that. Uh, volume source, mute, video. I mean, it says it's, it's not. I will appreciate your help. Who would have thought you'd push on the microphone? All right. Good morning, everybody, and thank you. Um, yes, welcome to Grand Rounds this morning. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Ma, who has been my go-to podiatrist as long as I've been a resident uh, here starting in 2012. Um, Dr. Ma is a board-certified, highly skilled podiatri podi podiatric surgeon. Uh, he treats a wide range of foot and ankle conditions. And he studied at uh, Whitman College for his bachelor's degree and then got a doctor of podiatric medicine from California College of Podiatric Medicine in San Francisco. He did a three-year residency in trauma and reconstructive surgery at the foot and ankle, or I'm sorry, in foot and ankle at the Northlake Medical Center in Georgia. He's chief of podiatric medicine and surgery at Providence St. Vincent's, and he also um, splits his time between there and here uh, in the Plaza Building. Uh, he teaches residents, he's an excellent uh, communicator and lecturer, and uh, I'm just so pleased that he can come and give us some insight into those two mysterious organs that live under our shoes. Uh, Dr. Ma, welcome. All right, good morning. We'll see if this one works. You everybody hear me okay? Great, well thanks for having me. It's great to see, I see a lot of familiar faces. So I've been asked to talk about common foot and ankle pathologies, and I've kept it pretty informal, so if you have any questions or comments, feel free to shout it out, you raise your hands. If you, uh, my goal is to keep everybody awake for uh, hopefully less than an hour, and we'll see what happens. So pretty much as a podiatrist in Oregon, we can pretty much do anything below the knee, so Achilles ruptures repairs, ankle fractures, you know, bone repairs, and then the dreaded diabetic foot that we all see in the ER. And one of the fun foot facts is 75% of Americans generally get foot and ankle pain. And specifically, for the lucky ones below the age 30 in this room, this lecture doesn't really reply to you. It's mostly around 30 is when the 75% stuff starts happening. And I know personally for me, when I turned 30, I was like, my foot starts hurting, my back hurts, and I got tendonitis in my elbow. So this is crazy. But it happens because all these things kind of just add up. And unfortunately, when it comes to the foot and ankle, it's just kind of like tires, just kind of wear and tear over time and, you know, starts to you know, re uh, start to wear out a little bit. Unfortunately, unlike tires, though, uh, we just can't replace them. So these are the um, conditions I'll go over, and, you know, we'll get through as many as we can, and I'll start distal and go proximal, and once again, if you have any comments, questions, just chime right in. I left the statistics out for the journal articles, so I'll just kind of recite them, um, just to kind of give you, a, you know, the background of each um, condition. So ingrown tunnel, this is pretty common here. We probably see in podiatry, probably one or two a day in the ER urgent care, probably every second, because, you know, especially in the summertime here, you're wearing sandals, somebody gets stepped on, and this occurs. So pretty much what happens is the toenail itself here, you know, pushes against the nail fold, and then it has a little cut in the skin. Next thing you know, you got a little bacteria, and you got this. Um, you know, the normal on your left here is generally flat like this, and then on the right, a little bit of curvature here. And, Unfortunately, for ingrown toenails, it's generally genetic. So I see a lot of patients that, you know, mom and then kids and cousins and aunt and uncles, just, just like a family heirloom that just keeps on giving away. And uh, it's tough because, unfortunately, there's no plastic surgery to make this flatten out to this. And I'll go over the procedure in a moment here, but the only way to get rid of, you know, the ingrown toenail or this curvature is just to remove the sides. Um, it's the procedure that's done to the 80 is probably the one of the few in podiatry or in dermatology too that it's pretty predictable. It's about 98% success rate. Um, it's one of the f almost for sure things or close to it that uh, provides pain relief. Um, what you'll see on your, you know, the EMRs or IC10s, the words onychocryptosis, that's ingrow toenail, perineica, the infection. The most common toe itself is the great toe just because it's the largest, but you can get it any toenail just because of the shape it's, you know, pretty much the same. Generally, prevention, you know, you try to sh uh, cut straight across. You can curve the ends a little bit. Um, but if you look on Google, there's like a million ways, and that just tells me there's, you know, the more ways you can try to fix something, that pretty much tells us that we have no, no, we have no idea how to fix it. So in this particular instance, for ingrown toenails, even if you try to cut it straight across, you'll still have issues because it's still curved. It's kind of like coloring your hair. It's, it's still the same color. 
Proper fitting shoes, you know, the tighter the shoes, of course, you compress it against the toenail can cause the irritation. One thing to keep in mind, you know, everybody here is a healthcare provider, we're on our feet 10, 12 hours a day. When you're trying on your shoes, try on the middle of the end of the day, your foot will swell about a quarter size bigger. And that's just kind of normal for every age, young, old, middle aged, it's all the same. And then lastly, pedicures, just be careful. If you dig a lot on the sides, if you get a little too close, you can clip the skin and as an entry point for bacteria. So when it's mild to moderate, and this is probably, you know, 80% we'll see in our clinics. It, this is the second toe here. It's a little red, it's a little erythematous, minimal drainage, you have a little serous. You know, generally for these, you'll come in, you know, I try or antibiotics, 500 milligrams, Keflex, if they're not allergic to the Keflex, you know, for about five days. You can put some antibiotic ointment on it. The most probably, you know, the next treatment is soaks. You know, soak it about 10 minutes, four times a day. Definitely helpful, kind of cleans out the debris, gets the water moving through it. The debris on the nail is question mark because it's got to be careful. If you cut some, you know, not enough of the nail, you could leave a jagged edge there and actually cause more issues. If it doesn't get better, you know, follow up with your primary care doctor or podiatrist in a week. The next step, if it still doesn't get better, is a minor nail procedure. If it's really bad, it's like this on both sides, you know, order antibiotics, but, you know, when it's this bad, it's, you have to remove the toenail. Just the soaks or the antibiotics, it just doesn't get better, unfortunately. So the techniques, there's kind of partial and total and kind of help to differentiate it. So the partial, you can just remove the side, one side if this unaffected side is okay. But if it's really bad like this, you gotta remove the whole toenail just because it, it doesn't get away the infection fast enough. So the techniques, there's kind of two types. The most common you'll see like, you know, urgent cares or if this is your first time event, you just remove the side on the side over here and then you can just let it grow back. Within about two or three days, all the pain goes away and you're good to go. However, if you have multiple ingrow toenails and it happens a lot, like, you know, every month or every two months, the next step you could add here is add a little phenol or silver nitrate in the back of the cuticle here to cauterize it so it doesn't grow back. It's about a 98% success rate. It works well. The only disadvantage about it is it makes your toenail a little bit thinner, about, you know, a few millimeters. So this is the partial one here. If it's really bad, the next thing is doing a total. So you just remove the whole toenail. This works well too. Um, once again, if you just let it grow back, it'll take about three to six months to grow back. If you find that, hey, I just don't want to see this toenail ever again, um, you can put a little phenol right here to cauterize it, and it basically after about three to six months, once the skin matures, um, at the top it looks like the back of your thumb. It's just flat right here. You can live your life without a toenail. You can still run, jogs. It's no big deal. So the post-operative management for these toenails soaks about 10 minutes, a couple times a day. You can apply silvidine, beta anamide ointment, anything just to kind of keep it moist. One thing I tell my patients, it can drain up to two to three weeks. It's common. And they take about two to three weeks to heal. That's about average. Um, you, but the good thing about these procedures, you can play sports afterwards. So you can run, jog, hike, still do your, if you're a kid, you can still do your chores. This is not one of the things where you're bedridden for weeks on weeks. This is, you do the procedure and you can play soccer the next day. It's okay. So the next thing proximal is hammer toes. And this is uh, the curvature of the toes right here. Um, they can cause like corns and calluses right on the top and on the bottom here. There's two types, there's flexible and rigid. Generally it starts as a flexible when you're a kid um, and then over time it becomes crap. It's kind of like Jupiter's contracture of your hand. You know, it gets a little bit stiffer and stiffer and then unfortunately the toe, the toe itself kind of gets stuck this position here. You know, here's a top view here. This is around, you know, 30 to 40 where they start to curl more and you get these dark spots on the toes here. And that's kind of more irritation of uh, from the shoe gear, and that's when you start running around, you start rubbing, it becomes more curved, you know, patients start noticing, hey, what's going on here? It's kind of bothering so. And then as you mature in age, it will get a little bit worse. Now, do you need to straighten these at all to fix them surgically? The answer is no, it only fix it if it really hurts. But they progress. This is the middle, this is the runner here. Here on your right here, you can see it's nice and flat, and this is just a you know, slow progression where it doesn't grab the ground, it starts to get red on the top from the shoes, and it can become painful, especially when you're running. And then as you get a little bit older, this is what can happen. And, you know, these are patients come in, and sometimes they come in, it's just so, so crooked. And I'm like, you know, just leave them alone. If they don't hurt, they're just the way it is. It's a genetic heirloom for your mom, dad, and it just happened. So conservative treatment, and this is probably one of the comments I'll see. You know, these pads that you'll see here, it's, it's basically back behind the airplane, you know, where you get those sheets, the books, and you open it up. I think 20 of the pages are these little pads for your neck, your lower back, and, you know, your, your feet. So... Some of them work, you know, I think the thought process behind them is just to kind of take away some of the pressure, but I will tell you, none of these gadgets or gizmos will like make your toe straight. It just doesn't happen here. But, you know, some will theory will say it decreases the progression of it. 
you know, I'd take that, but there's no long-term studies that say, hey, you wear this and you have no more hammer toes. You know, wider shoes, of course, so the taller the shoe, the better, so it doesn't rub, and then over-the-counter orthotics is to kind of take some of the pressure off the ball of your foot. So if it, does, if it doesn't hurt, no matter how contracted it is, just leave them alone. You know, if they start bothering you, then your options are, you know, a combination of soft tissue and bone um, work. And the goal of it, though, is how it hurts is as it progresses, it becomes more of a contracture. So here on your left is an x-ray. This is the distal end, this is the proximal end. The reason why it hurts is twofold. One, it starts to press on the top, this, but then the retrograde force, it pushes on the bottom, so you get the kind of the ball of the foot, and that's why it bothers them. So to get the pressure off the ball of the foot here, you actually have to straighten the toe, and that's kind of the conceptual for the patient to understand, say, hey, you gotta straighten your toe to take the pressure off the ball. So to do that, what you do is just, a, it's a linear incision, this is pretty common. You'll see 100 precisions in organ. It's pretty much gonna be done very similar this way. And you go in and take some of the bone out here. So at the beginning, when you get the toenail or the toe itself, the patient will tell you this thing is stiff. This becomes arthritic like the hand. If it's contracted like this for a long time, there's nothing I can do to pop it straight. It's stuck that way. So I describe it to the patient and say, you have a stiff toe that's crooked. And after you debride it, you realign the joint by taking remodeling and taking some of the bone out. You place a pin in it, and you have a stiff, straight toe. So the inner or the proximal phalanx in this center here, that where that bump was, that's still stiff. It's just proximately where you can still move your toes. So it kind of looks like this up and down. So pretty much it's like this and then up and down like this. Um, rather than having a painful crooked toe, you have a pain-free stiff toe. Um, you take the pin out in about four to six weeks. Uh, there are other gadgets you'll see in the community. Some people put internal pins. But the bottom line is, is make a toe straight and leave it in there for about four to six weeks for allow the bone to remodel. Afterwards, to take the pin out, you do it in the clinic here. Um, I don't have earrings, but I describe it to patients that it's like taking out your first earring because the skin kind of grows around a little bit. You twist it and it comes right out. No big deal. There's no nerves in the middle of the bone, so you don't really feel it. So here's the pre-op on your left here, and this is the post-op. Probably the only time I recommend, especially around the ages of 30 and 50, it's like, hey, you may want to consider fixing the toe is when the toe starts overriding or underriding the great toe. Um, that's probably the only time where I'm like, yeah, you may want to consider it. Can you still live with it? Yes, but I just know that as it progresses, it's harder to fix, and it causes more pain on the ball of your foot. Now, as it progresses like this, this, is, this gentleman was around 45. As you get mature in age, and you're around 70 and 80, I've had a lot of stoop patients come in and said, I know there's a surgery you can straighten out, but can you just remove this darn thing? The answer is yes. So the reason why is there's a big difference on the post-operative period. To, do, to get from this to this, this takes about six weeks to heal with the pin, and you have to do some physical therapy, which is great. The advantage of keeping the toe is, one, cosmetic, of course, and then two, functionally. If you remove this at an early age, this toe, the toe itself acts as a buttress, and this big toe will drift if you don't have it. But if you come in and you're 85 and said, I can't wear any shoe, this thing rides over and it's killing me, can I remove the toe? The answer is yes. That only takes about two weeks to heal. The surgery takes 15 minutes. It's four stitches. So it's a big difference. I think it just, depending on the stage of your life, I'll offer it. But at most of the time, at the latter stage of the life, the patients come in and say, I know what I want. I have good blood flow. Remove this thing because I don't want to see you again. And I'm like, hey, I'll go buy a fight and go through it. Um, the next thing of the thing is capsulitis. So this is kind of the outside of the ball here underneath the second, third, and fourth digit. And the three most common is capsulitis, stress fractures, and neuroma. And I'll go over each one here. Capsulitis is just like you know, inflammation or tendonitis in your hand. You get inflammation around the, the ball of your foot or joints. Highly, you know, most common is when you're standing on your feet 10, 12 hours a day, playing 20 games of soccer, you're just putting a lot of pressure on the ball of your foot. And here it's a little subtle, but you get some swelling on the bottom here. You can see it's nice and flat, not as uh, shiny. And you can see over here, the little callus here, just more pressure on it. And, you know, treatment, you know, very, just like the hand, anti-inflammatory, supportive shoes, and rest. Occasionally, if it's really bad, like really bad, and they've tried to do the rest for like four to six, you know, months, and it still bothers you, occasionally I'll do a cortisone injection. I'm always hesitant for the capsulitis because, you know, if you do a lot of cortisone injections, it weakens or breaks down the soft tissue, so you can cause, cause a soft tissue atrophy for the fat pad, or you can get, you know, some uh, adhesions in the hair or irritations of the steroid. So the next thing is stress fracture. So the two most common on the ball is stress fracture and neuromas, and I'll talk to you about how to differentiate. This is the most common thing that we'll see in you know, February. 
And the reason why is in January, they wake up and say, I'm going to lose 100 pounds in two weeks. And I'm like, you know what? That's awesome. However, these things can happen. And four weeks down the road, they come in and say, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't fall, trip. My son didn't kick me, but my foot's killing me. Um, highly likely a stress fracture. And you can get an x-ray, but it's hard. So this is a classic sign you'll see here where you get a little puffiness or the callus around the toe. This is what you'll see on all our medical boards. However, to get to this uh, density level, it takes about six, eight weeks to get there, and the patient's going to see you earlier. So, of course, the x-ray's going to come back. You're going to tell them it's a stress fracture, but they're not going to remember the word stress. They're going to say, hey, you said the word fracture. They're going to go to prob the link, you know, the patient care. They'll look online and be like, the x-ray says negative. But you just have to explain to them, hey, how I tell them a stress fracture is, remember you're younger, you took a pencil, you try to kind of break it, you hear a crack, but you can still use the pencil, that's what a stress fracture is. And I'll try to emphasize that, that hey, you're going to get an x-ray because we're in America and everybody gets x-rays because it hurts. <laughs> I know, I'm with it too, just like lab work. Um, but they'll come back and say, you told me it was a stress fracture. They hear fracture, but it ain't broken. But it still hurts. Um, I try to, like, you know, not use the word fracture as much, but it happens. So if it really bothers you about two months and it still hurts and you want a definitive, you can get a bone scan or an MRI, and the MRI will show you have edema in the middle, and it's, the radiologist will pick it up, you know, 99% of the time. Probably one of the few times to get an MRI are athletes that want to play that weekend. So you can get away with stress fractures in the ball of your foot. If you want to play football on Sunday, you go right ahead. But if you can get stress fractures that are under the bones, the most other ones like the navicular, the ankle bones, if you get one of those, I'm going to have to tell you, hey, if you play sports, it's against medical advice because you could crack. Clinical care, three. So that's probably the only the few times I'll get an MRI. But if it's the ball of your foot, I'll say, hey, get some rest, and uh, it will heal. The most common you'll see is the second and third metatarsal stress fractures, and then the second most common is these outer two, and then the first great toe, pretty, pretty rare. You'll see some puffiness here right on the top of the foot. Stress fractures are unique, though. They'll be able to close your eyes and tell you it hurts right there and tell you which metatarsal it is. The other ones here, the class that you hear is a Jones fracture. This is in the, in the metaphyseal area here where it uh, jumps in here. Those ones there, it's a little bit, you know, you're, I'm more aggressive on the uh, safety of it, so I'll put them in a fracture boot longer to help. That's a different lecture, but sometimes, you know, in young athletes, I'll do surgery to put a pin across it. Stress fracture, the most common, you'll see probably one in the hospital right now, if somebody wearing one of these, these fracture boots here, if they're against it. So they say, it doesn't fit my outfit, or it messes up my back because it's too high. I understand. The next thing you want to consider is at least offer them, say, hey, don't wear your flip-flops. Wear either the most stiffest shoe out there for a running shoe is Brooks Beast, or you wear just your stiffest hiking shoe. So go to REI or you know, any of the uh, stores and just get a stiff hiking shoe. Because what you want to do is the bottom of your foot, it doesn't want to move. So here, there's no movement on the bottom of a fracture boot. It has a rocker bottom, so it takes the stress off the bottom of the foot. If it's really bad, you could put a non-weight-bearing cast. So in the older orthopedic books, the traditional, the gold standard is a cast non-weight-bearing. But it's a little overkill. I think the fracture boot just fine. And then, of course, decreased activity is about four weeks. Takes about four weeks to heal. Four to six weeks to heal is average. But it's, I would tell you, almost everybody in their lifetime gets a stress fracture. It just happens. And the next thing about the foot is neuroma. You get these sharp shooting pains. The most common is the third inner space. I don't know who Morton's is, but he got a name or he, she got a name on it. Morton's neuroma. Sharp shooting. You know, I describe it to patients like it's kind of hitting your funny bone in your arm, elbow. You hit your funny bone here, but it hurts in your foot. It's the same thing. You hit on the ball of your foot, but most of the time you'll hit this um, pain in the ball of your foot, be a second or third toe. The aroma pain is hard to describe, though. It, it feels like a lump. You know, it's, it's not as specific as a um, stress fracture. Generally, no history of trauma, and it is related to activities, especially here in the Northwest. A lot of the homes here are hardwood floors. So I even have patients that move from a carpeted floor, and six months later, they move to a house that hardwood floors, and all of a sudden, they have two things, an aroma and lower back pain. I'll say, hey, you got to wear some sandals or something because, you know, you're stepping, you know, more steps in your house than probably at work. Biggest difference, though, between a neuroma and a stress fracture is swelling. Neuromas don't swell. So if they're swelling, just look in your mind, hey, probably lean more towards a stress fracture because the bones will swell. Nerves don't. And that's kind of the delineation that I'll look for if, hey, it's a neuroma or a stress fracture. Um, here's the left semester tarsal. So the neuroma goes in between. So these are common digital nerves right on the side or in between there. So in shoes, if it's really tight, so if you're at the end of the hike and your foot starts getting numb, it starts to ache, this is what happens here. It compresses. Here's the neuroma here. 
and it just starts you know, getting some shooting pain. Can you get other neuromas in other spaces? You can. Um, about 30% you can get in the fourth interspace, and the other 20 combination of the first and second. They're pretty rare. The most of the time is the third interspace. Supposedly there's anatomically, they've done some studies, that that's the area where it's most exposed to the bottom of your foot. But you know, can you get in other spots? You can. Uh, conservative treatment, you know, anti-inflammatory, supportive shoes. This one, on the other hand, if there's no swelling, you, you, know, you know it's a neuroma. Steroid injections have been shown to sh uh, it works well. Um, I use Depamedrol, you can use Kenalog, just a real low dose. Um, you know, you can do up to two, um, you know, within three to four months apart, just to kind of decrease or shrink the nerve. Um, there are other treatments, like alcohol injections, but majority of the time, about 80% of the time, the steroid injection, it works. Um, if you're afraid of needles, you know, you can take anti-inflammatories for two or three weeks just to kind of decrease inflammation. Um, I rarely use oral steroids for this just because most of the time we're like, hey, you know, why don't you take the steroid, isolate a steroid because I think it's a better result because you put them a higher concentration in the area. If that doesn't help and you still hurts a lot, then you can do surgery to take the nerve out. It's pretty straightforward. You take the nerve out either on the bottom or the top. And then what happens, you look like here, you get a swelling of the nerve. Some patients will ask for an MRI. The tricky part about the MRI is it's hard to see these nerves. These nerves are really small. So you can even get, majority of the time, the MRIs are negative for any soft tissue swelling or nerve size to it, but you can still take symptoms of a neuroma. So how I will help them, if they get an MRI and say, hey, I don't have a neuroma, I'll do a diagnostic injection without the steroid to show them and say, hey, if you do the surgery here, this is what it'll feel like. I'll inject it on the bottom of your foot where the neuroma is and have them go for a couple of days and say, hey, if you like the feeling, that, yes, there's no pain, but it's numb between the toes a little bit, that's potentially what I'll get to you. And if they say, hey, I got 80% relief with the diagnostic injection, I'll say, hey, you're an option for the neuroma. So the funny thing about the neuroma surgery itself, the neuroma surgery is one of the simpler ones here. It takes about 30 minutes outpatient. It takes about two to three weeks to heal once the skin to heal. The two risks for it is one, like any surgery infection, but more specifically for the neuroma is you potentially you can grow back about three to five percent, and that's for anybody in the world. You get a hundred podiatrists, hundred orthopedists, to take the nerve out, about three to five percent will grow back, and it may grow back in a one year, it may grow back in five years. I don't know. It's all over the board, but that's probably the one risk that I emphasize to them that if the body just wants to grow out. Um, if it does grow out and you do all the conservative treatment again, and they want to rinse and repeat the surgery, you have to go more proximal to remove more nerve. I rarely do them because majority of the time, the conservative treatment does the trick. It's maybe like two or three a year, but if it happens, you know, take it out and see how you do. All right, any questions on the ball of the foot or ingrow toenails? No? All right, we'll keep on going. All right, so we focus on the big toe, and so it's this area here. So the big toe itself, unfortunately, as it curves more, it can cause the hammer toe because it pushes the toe up here. And these are the three most common that we'll talk about here this morning is bunion, gout, and arthritis. Um, unfortunately, bunions and hammer toes, it is genetic. You know, to tell you how big they get, you know, it's all over the board. Um, is it acquired or congenital? I think it's a combination of both. I think it's 60% congenital and the other 40%, you know, acquired. And the reason why I say that is, you know, Males and females both get it. It's probably like a 60, 40, 60 ma female, 40 male. But you know, pay, there's a study that went over to an island and looked at all the people's feet. They, know, they don't wear shoes, and people still had bunions. So I'm like, well, the shoes can't be causing it. But I think that if you wear really tight shoes every day for 20 years of your life, and you have, you know, your mom had bunions, your dad had bunions, you, you will push yourself to get the bunion even bigger faster. So I think there's a combination of both. So the shoe gear, that's why it's question mark. Um, you know, if it's men, most men, a majority, Oregon's a little different, they don't wear high heel shoes. So, but I still see men doing bunions. I've done bunion surgery on them. It, it, I don't think it caused by a shoe, but it may just kind of progress or makes it progress faster. Uh, bunion splints is an option. Wider shoes, of course, doesn't push on it. And orthotics to take the pressure off the, the jo toe joint. These devices here, I mean, they all work. I think, you know, slows down the progression. But, you know, if you have the bunion, there's nothing out there to pop it in place in lieu of surgery. It's just, this is what it is. So I'm going to go over, so you'll have your patients you refer to an orthopedist or a podiatrist. And, you know, some of your patients will have, hey, you took four weeks to heal. How come yours was faster? And I sent another patient, and it took six weeks to heal, and you're in a cast. And I'll go over that. And what it is is here's the actuary of your foot here. This is the big toe to little toe. Dots, of course, patients always ask, what are those? And I can tell them it's sesamoids that work like a kneecap in your big toe. 
what a bunion is, is basically the distance between the big toe and the second toe. So if you look at this here, see how the second and third and fourth toes are really close together. And unfortunately, this angle here, as the bunion gets bigger, these two areas here just get spread or get farther and farther. And it's the distance between the big toe and the little uh, second toe is how it's uh, determined on what procedure you use. There is an algorithm where angle one, you do this, angle two, and so on and so forth. So on the simpler ones here, so it's a mild bunion here, and here it kind of stucks out, it pushes on the side. Some patients, by the way, will get some numbness. It's because there's a large nerve that goes right on top of the toe. So if you wear tight shoes, it's hitting it, and you'll feel some zinger. So when you take the shoe off, you're like, oh, it feels a lot better. And here's the side view. It gets a little bit red on the side. So here, this is the mild here. You know, on the angle here, this is about 12 to 14, and it's this distance. So the whole goal for any of the procedures for bunion surgery, and there's like, eh, maybe five to 10 that people do, but it's probably one of the most um, predictable procedures that out there. Bunion surgery has been done since about the 80. I will tell you the technique, this is the tried and true, it hasn't changed in like, I don't know, 20 years. It's still, and I'll show you a picture called a chevron where it's a little V, you cut and move it. Now the fixations change, just like knee surgery, you know, different technology of how to fix it, but the principle hasn't changed. So this is the cut here, um, cut in the V and you just shift it over and this is what it looks like, just like this. And you put a pin in there, you put a screw, you put a what, whatever you like. It, it all works. The bottom line is your goal is to get this knuckle closer than this knuckle. That's it. And that makes it shorter here. So when you do it on the distal end here, you can generally walk on this. This recovery is a lot faster. You're in a boot in about four to six, you're out of the, into a shoe in about four to six weeks. Um, so these are the mild ones that, you know, get repaired. And it looks like this on the side view. Um, so here's a pre-op. Uh, four to six weeks, risk for surgery, just like any surgery infection, delay in the skin. Specific for this, so sometimes your bunion can recur, can it recur within a year, five years, 10 years, who knows, but the other one is less than like 2%, the toe can go the other way. So it's called a hallux varus. If it goes the other way, man, their patients are pissed because they can't wear any shoes. If it drifts over again, they're probably a little upset, but it's no worse than they were before. The other one over here, if it points over this direction, you gotta be careful. You know, there are things to fix it, to strap it, or to revise the surgery. But that one you have to fix because you'll be able to never fix it. It's harder to walk because you can't propel or push off your big toe. As the bunion gets larger, so, you know, as you mature in age, so you have your bunion at, you know, 30, and then you get a little bit over 40, and it gets a little bit bigger. It can drift, and what happens is just this area just gets bigger and bigger. So I'll show you an x-ray. You can see this one, the distance between the first and second metatarsal head is significantly large, almost double. So as the angle gets larger here, you have to do more something more proximal. And once you get to the more proximal part, that's when you get that one patient and say, how come you had a bunion and you're in a cast now for four to six weeks? And that's kind of the crux of it. And how to do it, you basically just you know, realign it, cut a wedge, or you can put a pin to hold it together. And once again, the whole goal at the bottom line is make this knuckle closer to this knuckle. The next thing is hallux limitus or arthritis to the big toe. This is the one where you get the bump on the tops rather than the bump on the side. And this is the stiff toe joint. This is arthritis, very similar to the hand on the bottom of the thumb. It's a stiff joint, pain with range of motion, very common in like soccer players, uh, runners that do a lot of range of motion in the big toe joint. They feel a bump and it's right on the top. And this is the spur on the top. And this one, you can't miss it. I would tell you, majority of the patients get an x-ray, you go, oh yeah, I see it, it's right there. Conservative treatment, just like bunions, padding, wider shoes. This one, though, if it hurts because it's arthritic, just like the hand or the knee, if it's arthritic, you can do a cortisol injection, try to decrease inflammation. But I do tell patients, I emphasize, if I do the injection, it doesn't make the bump go away. It'll just take away some of the pain. There are a lot of procedures for it, just like the knee. You know, there's some joint spares where you can kind of clean it up. And then as it get progresses, um, you can do replacements. You can do a fusion to stiffen it. It's kind of basically patient specific and then patient age specific. So there's a lot of procedures, but the most popular that I'll go over is the chylectomy. And that one's kind of like a knee scope where you go in and clean it up. It's basically a cleanup of the joint. And what you do, and I'll go back to the x-ray is, you take this, you know, it's a minor procedure. It takes about two weeks to heal. It's outpatient, it's about 45 minutes. And what it is, you just draw a straight line and you just remove all the spurs right on the top. And this allows the joint from the bottom to move up over here. You can walk on it outpatient, once you take the sutures out, you can go, go back to your sports. The only problem with this procedure is everybody gets better. So you remove their, the spur and the joint starts moving. It's just, and I know it's not a word, but the word betterness is all over the board. 
So patients sometimes get 10% better, some people get 80% better. And what I found is everybody's response to arthritis is different. Some of our patients, they get an x-ray, and you look at it going, this is going to hurt. And they walk in, and they're like, no, it's for the other ankle or something, or the other knee. And it happens. And then some other patients, they come in and say, ah, oh, it's not that bad. And they're like looking at you going, this is the horrible. So for me, when it comes to this procedure, I don't know. But I will tell you, everybody gets better. If the colectomy doesn't work, can you do the next thing, like a knee replacement, a toe replacement? The answer is yes. Um, but it does buy him time. But you know, I work with the knee surgeons here, and it, it's curious because you go in and say, oh, I got a little meniscal tear, clean it up. And some patients think, oh, freaking awesome. Others are like, nope, didn't do a thing. And it's very similar to the colectomy here where everybody gets you know, mixed reviews, but um, the whole goal is just to remove the bump to allow increased range of motion. The next thing is gout. So a red hump, swollen joint, no trauma. Your elevated uric acid, you know, if they see me a week later, it's hard because we get the blood, blood result for it. Sometimes because you're a seven-day delay, the body's already kind of washing out, so you could get a normal one. Um, but what I emphasize on patients, it is a destructive process. And I'll show them some pictures. Like, if you get a lot of gout attacks, your joint's getting eaten. And it's not only the big toe joint, but it's your ankle, your knee, your hip, any joint. And the only reason why it's, you know, the higher rate of the big toe joint is there's a study that, that took temperatures of all the joints, and the big toe joint is the coldest. It's about five, to t five degrees colder. So what happens is, like that science experiment we had in middle school, you take salt and cold water, the salt crystallizes, but you warm the water up, you know, the salt um, goes away or it uh, dissolves. The radiographic signs, the radiologist will tell you this, but the bottom line is they'll tell you, hey, you got some early arthritis if you have a lot of gout attacks. So this is what it looks like. You just got tophi, you know, very similar to ones you'll see like behind the ear if it's really bad. It's kind of chalky material. Treatment itself, steroids, you know, NSAIDs. Biggest thing here is warm soaks. So it's common, kind of like an ankle sprain. They'll say, oh, it's red hot swollen. I got to cool it down. Unfortunately, with gout is actually the opposite. You got to actually warm it up like that experiment. If you warm it up a little bit, the crystals, the uric acid will dissolve live and actually will give you some pain relief. And for the diet, this is the hardest one. Decrease alcohol, red meats, and shellfish. I mean, this is what everybody loves. And it's tough because it's a higher pyrimidine amount and it can cause this effect. When it comes to the alcohol, you know, if you got to pick one, pick the Chardonnay. But the bottom line is, I don't care what alcohol you drink, it could be just light beer or something, it, it dehydrates you. So back to the science experiment, if you take a lot of water out and you still have the same amount of salt, salt's going to crystallize. So if I tell the patients, hey, stick to the white wine, but just, you know, emphasize, don't drink the whole bottle still, just drink a few glasses. Um, because they'll say, oh, I don't only drink, I don't have to drink red anymore, I'll just drink white, I can drink more of it. That's not the case. If you have a lot of gouty attacks, like, you know, once a month, it will eat away the joint. And you'll see the same, you know, you could call this as a knee or a hip too. This is what happens, the joint just gets eroded. So I'll tell my patients, if you have, you know, more than, if it's a one-time event, no big deal. But if you happen to get another month, you're going to see your primary doctor to get worked up to maybe get on medication, the most popular, as we know, allopurinol. Um, more times than not, though, I think it's funny, though, they'll come back to me a year later and say, hey, my, my gout went away, my primary care doctor is awesome, but my gout came back. I was like, well, did you still take your medications? Oh, no, it went away, I stopped it. I'm like, well, you may want to keep taking it. But what I've seen, and it is real, you say, stop the allopurinol, it's like the worst gout ever. So because all of your sudden your body is just like, holy smokes, you got all this in you. So I'll refer them back to the primates, hey, you may want to get set up to get back on the medication. It's a, it's a for lifer. This is not one of those, it's like Advil, you just take a few days and it just goes away. Any questions on the big toe? I got four kids, but this is two of them. The grocery stores, this is all they want to do. Everything else, it's, it's, a, it's a circus, but it's okay, it's, it's, it's fun. All right, so ganglion cysts, like the wrists, you know, it's right on the side here. I generally don't fix them. Um, you can aspirate them, take the fluid out. Probably the only time I'll take them out are if they hurt with shoe gear or if there's over a nerve right on the top. So if they wear a shoe and their foot gets numb because it's right on the cyst, um, you can aspirate it. Sometimes you can backfill it with some little steroid to kind of scar it down. Um, you know, surgery itself, you just take the balloon out, tie off the stock. Uh, there's about 10, 20% recurrence rate just because the flu is still there, or you can get another weak point and have another cyst. Um, but can you live with it? The answer is yes. Um, you can stick a light bulb, to, or you know, a light or flashlight, make sure it glows. So if it doesn't glow like you know the normal color, like a yellowish tinge, you may want to consider taking out. I'll biopsy every of them if I do take them out. But the chances of cancer of these sides in the foot is less than the lottery statistic. That's been shown too. So the next option is heel pain. It's probably the most popular thing that we'll see in any clinic, and there's two types of heel pain in the back. You get the posterior and the plantar. I'll talk about both and how to differentiate it. But there's a lot of little different types. You got the traumatic, neurologic, arthritic. 
but the most popular one here is plantar fasciitis. And the term you'll see on the, like Google is post-static dyskinesia. It's basically pain after rest. Um, what happens is as you sleep, you know, your foot will dangle, and the distance between your heel bone and your toes, the plantar fascia will shrink. You take that first step, it pulls, and that's why it hurts. Improves with exercise. So, yes, after you get out of bed, you start moving around, you know, as you stretch it, it does get better. Most of the time, it's pain on the bottom of the medial calcaneus, but you can get in the central panel band, just, you know, like the hand, the whole bottom can hurt. Differential diagnosis, stress fractures, orthopathies, nerve entrapments, collisions, these are rare when it comes to heel pain, but I'll get an x-ray. Um, to, just to make sure it's not a stress fracture. You know, one thing you can do is squeeze from side to side of the heel. That's more of a stress fracture. Plantar fasciitis is mostly on the bottom. So the plantar fascia, so patients come in a lot and will say, hey, I have this. Can you just do surgery to cut it? And the answer is, you probably not. In the majority of the time, you kind of want to try to avoid cutting the plantar fascias because the plantar fascia is, you know, the whole structure on the bottom. So you see here, it's the whole bottom here. So I've seen, and the literature supports it, if you cut it, some patients, because you don't have that kind of the bow strung, you flatten it out, you can get a little arch support, a loss of arch or a flat foot over time, and that can be another can of worms that irritates you. You can get also hammer toes too, because the toe wants to grip down. So majority of the time, about 90%, 95% of the time, plantar fasciitis is cured with um, physical therapy, or it's just stretching. So you get an x-ray here, make sure there's no stretch fracture. If stretch fracture, you'll see a line right here, but the most common, you'll see the patient, hey, that spur, can you just cut it out? So in the 80s or the early 70s, people used to do surgery and just cut this out all the time. And they found out over time, it's actually not the spur that's causing the pain. It's the plantar fascia that connects to the spur that's the irritant. So it's the stretching or decrease in inflammation of the plantar fascia. There is a posterior heel spur, and I'll show you x-rays here. That's different, though. That one here, you know, you may have the surgery removed. But the bottom on the heel of the heel, I haven't moved one in years. So I mean, in more, I mean, enjoy the community here. They'll say, hey, try the conservative at least six months, eight months to see before you do any surgery to kind of cut that plan of fashion. So treatment, and I'll go over even. Number one, or the two th top four things there is number one is exercise therapy. And then shoe gear, you know, yes, I wouldn't wear, you know, flip-flops every day. You may want to wear a more stable shoe in the meantime until you heal. Night splints, that's one thing you'll Google. It's like, what's the coolest contraption to wear? That's the most popular. Uh, studies have shown that say, hey, that actually helps. Arch support, strapping. Coarsal injection is an option. I generally don't do coarsal injection on the first line. Maybe, you know, four to six weeks later, if it still bothers you, I'll offer it to them. And then oral steroids, um, anti-inflammatories, you know, if it's really inflamed. So this is the most popular stretch. If you type in plantar fascia stretch, there's a million of them. But the whole goal is basically stretch the Achilles. So you won't feel the plantar fascia stretch the Achilles tendon attaches to the heel bone and then it connects to the plantar fascia. So when you stretch your Achilles, it takes the stretch off that plantar fascia. Majority of the time, people that have plantar fasciitis will have a tight Achilles, and that's the goal for this. So next time you're in a grocery store, you see somebody you know, putting their toes to your nose, you're like, hey, they probably have plantar fasciitis, because it's pretty common. But this is the stretch. And then after you get it healed, I emphasize the patients, make sure you stretch both sides, and still do it forever, because if you don't, you'll come right back. Um, stretching, I'll tell them to do in the morning and the evening. If you brush your teeth twice a day with the Sonicare, use that as a timer. So you brush your teeth twice. That's usually the easiest time, so you can do both at the same time. Devices, here's a night splint here. Same thing like stretches. There's a lot of different night splints. And the whole goal is to put, you know, stretch the Achilles. It's the same thing. You don't have, I don't know why they call it night splint, but you can work sleeping, or you can do it in the day, watching TV, in dinner. If you're on a long flight, put it on. If you're traveling in the car, in a bus, put it on. Art supports, the one over the counter I recommend is called Superfeet. You can get custom ones if your insurance cover it. I think it's a great idea. Treatment, you know, three to six months, usually it just goes away, sometimes a little bit longer. If it doesn't help, you can do regenerative medicine, so you can do PRP injection, shockwave therapy. We do those in our clinic. Um, and then possible surgery, I have probably haven't done one in like two years. It's a, it's a real simple procedure, just basically cut the ligament and let it stretch out, but you know, there's a lot of ramifications to it. Now the posterior heel pain. This is the one here is the back. You can see the spur on the back, so that's the difference here. Generally the pump bump, you see on the picture here coming up, the name of it's Haglund's deformity. That's probably the most Google or common word you'll see. And it's this bump right in the back. And these ones are tough because you know, in lieu of like flip-flops, it's hard to push right in the back or to avoid this bump here. Pain on the insertion, you can't get a little bursa from it because it get irritates it from the shoe. Diagnostic engine, you can get an x-ray like I just showed you. You get, you know, it goes right on the bump, right on the side here. 
This occurs from just traction injury. So if you do a lot of running, the Achilles pulls on the bone right here, and, it, and the spur kind of grows over time. These are the terms you'll see, if you see, you know, from physical therapists, podiatrists, orthopedists. They're all kind of the same. It's just basically you got some inflammation right in the back here. So here's a patient that has a heel pain on the first spur on the bottom. That doesn't hurt. It's all this back here. You can get calcifications in the Achilles that irritates them. First line of treatment, just like plantar fasciitis, ice, orthotic, anti uh, gastroc stretching. Second line, this one's a little bit more because you can't do, I don't recommend steroid injections in the Achilles because it can rupture it. This is one of the few times I'll offer, hey, if you want to do a you know, dose pack and then a blow knee and, uh, cast to calm it down. So once you get calmed down, the tricky part is this. When you get to this, you get that inflammation down, but unfortunately the bump is still there. So there's nothing out there conservatively where I can make this bone spur go away. It just doesn't happen. So when the patient is done healing and say, hey, I'm better, I don't have the ache anymore, but I got still the bump, then they have to make the decision, do you want to do surgery or not to remove it? And that's the hard part. And I'll show you some pictures of there. And I, I tell patients, you can live with it. Just wear you know, a little softer back so it doesn't rub to the back. But if you want to do surgery, here's your options. And it's a surgery right in the back of your heel. And pretty much what you do is just take the bone spur off. And this is what it looks like, just a big bump right in the back. And it smooths out. There's different ways to do it within the community. Some people use bone anchors, a plate. But the bottom line is to reattach the Achilles back to the bone to take the spur off so it doesn't rub against the shoe. You can't walk on about four weeks. Unfortunately, for any surgery here, um, if it's the right foot, you legally can't drive. So that's a tough part when it comes to foot surgery. Um, you can't walk on for four weeks, and then you progress to uh, physical therapy. The full recovery is about uh, three to six months. So it's a tough one, but you know, if it bothers you, then you know, here are your options. Postoperative, not wait for four weeks, and then physical therapy. Uh, let's see, I got more minutes. So next thing is flat feet. So there's two types. There's flat foot flexible and flat, you know, rigid flat foot. And there's, you know, a lot of people have flat feet. A majority of the time it doesn't hurt. But if it comes bother you, when it comes to the kids, so treat a lot of kids, you know, I don't know why it is, this is anecdotal, but it only hurts when they're around 100 pounds or above. If you're, no matter how flat your foot is, if you're 100, 100 pounds, it's just not gonna hurt. But as you get taller and get a little bit heavier, doing more adult sports, um, you can become uncomfortable. And this is what it looks like. You have a complete arch loss. Um, you know, it comes in, you have a knee valgus, and it irritates them. Most of the time, it's actually not foot pain. It's going to be tendon pain because the tendon starts to work harder, and it irritates them. So here are the x-rays here, just completely flat on the side. Um, other things, as you progress as older, if it's uncomfortable, it's called posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, or you get complete loss of the arch. One thing, you know, you can ask if they have, hey, I got arch pain here. It's not on the heel, but it's on the ankle, usually right on here. You have some swelling. And I'll show you. You can ask them to come up to give you an idea. Is it more of a tendonitis, or is it, hey, this is more to it, like, you know, a potential partial rupture? If you have the patient hold up like this, and it's right here, if they can get on your tippy toes, but it hurts, most likely it's tendonitis. But if they cannot get on the tippy toes, um, you have to just, in your mind, think, oh, it could be partial rupture. Because to get on your tippy toes, this tendon, the, the posterior tibial tendon, connects to the bottom of your foot. That's the first muscle that allows you to go up a stair or to push up. So it's the first you know, one inch of your heel lift. And after that, it's your Achilles. But if you cannot get on your first lift and it's swollen here, it's painful, kind of come to your mind and say, hey, your x-rays are normal. You can't get on your heel. You may want to get an MRI or refer to an orthopedist podiatrist to take a look. Because that one here, it's a little more severe. Because what you don't want to do sometimes is, if it's tendonitis, great. But you send them to a physical therapist, and you're actually working on the torn tendon. You can actually, in that one, it can make it worse. Um, lateral medial, you can see his complete arch. And you, you'll see, this is pretty common. Majority of the time, you know, flat feet doesn't hurt. But if it does hurt, those are the signs that I look for. Conservative treatment, you know, custom arch supports is the best. I think over-the-counter, it just doesn't work. You can get some bigger ones with putting ankle orthotics that help. These are hard, especially for kids. They'll look at you funny going, no way am I wearing that to school. Yeah, I understand. Um, but it happens. You try these orthotics for at least four to six weeks. Um, a stiffer shoe. The shoe you want to do is something that's stiff in the center. So the New Balance, Asics, Brooks. I'll email to Dr. Powell this lecture here. So it has a list of shoes that you know are different types that I recommend, including sandals. Um, surgical planning. So if you you know after a year or two, if it still bothers you, you can either live with it, but it's uncomfortable, or you can get it fixed. When it comes to kids, you can do some uh, bone grafts in here. So here's one here. You put a little bone graft here, and these work. This is probably one of my favorite procedures to do for kids because it's you know, pretty instantaneous. They got an arch, put a little graft here. It takes about six weeks to heal. 
um, and it, it absorbs so there's no hardware in there, and you have a little arch there. As you get mature in age, if it's really flat and they've tried the braces and say, hey, I can't walk more than a block, you know, majority of the time when it comes to foot and ankle surgery, I tell them, hey, if, you know, you only do it if it affects your daily life. I have some patients say, it hurts when I'm mile 20 when I'm walking. I'm like, well, you know, mile 18, stop then. <laughs> I know, but it happens. So I'll tell patients, hey, if you can't go to the grocery store, go to the mailbox, then you have to start thinking that's going to affect your daily life. Um, then I'll consider, hey, you want to fix it, yes or no, but it's still an option. Probably the only times I recommend surgery, you know, like any of the body is, if it's infected or if it's broken and you can never walk, then those are the things I probably push for it um, or encourage. Um, the picture for this, when it comes more severe, you got to put more screws and plates in it to hold the player to give you an arch. Both of these procedures, you can't walk on it for six to eight weeks. It's a long journey for both these procedures. You're looking at about six months, um, but it's satisfying. But, you know, you get walking better. Um, more comfortable, you can actually you know, go places. I think um, for the kids and adults, I, one of the markers I use is for the kids especially, like, hey, you know, grandma was beating me at Disneyland. I'm like, well, you may want to consider fixing it. And that's some of the markers I've had come back. Another marker I've seen are the kids, especially like, hey, you know, their best friend can play three soccer games and they can do all game and play the next day three more soccer games. And my child, they play a half a game and they're out. And some of the mark, I think from the kids, because they can't tell like us adults where they say, hey, this is affecting my life. They're just more like, I'm just tired or I don't want to play sports or they rub in their legs. So that's some of the kind of the markers that I look for. Like I said, I don't operate on all the kids. This is like 2%, but this is what I specialize in. It's just one of those where I'm like, there's your markers. So if I see the kids with a flat feet or see with adult, I'll say, hey, these are things you can do. Wear good shoes. If you want to wear flip flops, just be careful, um, but give you support. And if it doesn't hurt, great. Um, you know, I wouldn't go to Hawaii and wear flip-flops, you know, all seven days. It can, you know, predispose you to have some tendonitis. All right, so it's 8.50. I got more, but do you have any questions? I'll open up to the floor. I'll go to the end. Here's my contact stuff. Feel free to call me. My office number, cell phone. I'm open. I do a lot of consults in the hospital. Um, like I said, you know, my goal for all my patients is just, hey, what can I help you as fast as I can conservatively with no surgery? Because in this day and age, you got to work, you got kids, you got family. My goal is to get you back to your daily life as fast as you can. And if you have to, you know, surgery is an option. All right. Yep, to the left. Yeah, so tarsal tunnel syndrome. That's a tricky one. So. So some of the features are like uh, carpal tunnel of the hand. You get some numbness, end of the day, you have that positive snail, you hit the nerve on your uh, ankle and it starts to zing. The tricky part about though is, the studies have shown from the neurologist is, so when it comes to carpal tunnel, you get an EMG study, and if it's positive, then you do surgery and it becomes negative. The tricky part about for the ankle is, not all tarsal tunnel is positive. So you can, can get a negative EMG study and you still have the symptoms. I do get MRIs to look at the muscles around them. Um, and then if you have some muscle atrophy, some changes in there, I'll do a diagnostic injection. So I'll do a lidocaine above proximal to see if the pain goes away. Um, but I will tell you, you want to try to avoid tarsal tunnel surgery like the plague because it's a long recovery and sometimes it just doesn't work. Conservative treatments, I found you know, acupuncture, orthotics, uh, massage therapy to kind of take some of the pressure away. I think that, that works. Um, but it, it's a tough condition. It's rare, but when you have it, it's tough because it's like a, it's almost like it's neuropathy, but it's usually unilateral and the, you know, sting on it and you hit it just right. If you do get the MRI, some of the more slam dunk ones are if you get like ganglion cysts next to the nerve, or sometimes you can get an extra muscle pushing against the nerve, then that's one of those where I'm like, hey, you may want to consider taking it out because you can cause permanent numbness. Probably the only time I recommend tarsal tunnel surgery is when you start getting muscle weakness. Because when the object or when the nerve starts getting compressed, like your hand, you get that, you know, the of the atrophy, then I'm like, hey, you know, you stop not moving your toes, that's a big deal. But if it's consistent as numbness, you know, I'll, you know, I'll try some short doors, you have a pet and try to take away the pain. But, you know, the physical therapy, massage, and acupuncture is what I recommend. Does that answer your question? So Taylor's bunion, very similar to the bunion I showed you in the picture, it's just the other side on the outside. The reason why it's called Taylor's bunion is, you know, Taylor's in the past, they crossed their legs and it hurts. So wider shoes to push on the side. If you decide you want to do surgery, it's, it's like the colectomy I talked about. It's basically a bone spur removal. It takes about two to three weeks to heal. 
Um, it's basically the outs, it's a reverse of a bunion. That part, no. Yeah, it's because it's it the toe, the fifth toe is usually straight. It's just that bump. You know, to straighten out your, or to blow out your shoes or make them wider, one trick that I've learned is you fill water and like double bag it. You put it in your shoe. You stick in your freezer for a couple of days. The water will expand, stretch your leather shoes or stretch, you know, all your shoes out. Take the shoe out, defrost it, take the water out, and that will help it too. One trick I've also learned, a lot of the ski shops they have this insulator, they'll insulate it, they'll put it in there, it's like a balloon but with warm air and that, that will kind of spread out. So people that are skiing or snowboarders, you can do that too to kind of bump it out like a half side or something to take the pressure away. Oh, oh you go ahead. Oh, that's a good question. So, and also, another thing is um, you, the physiology behind the, 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 the anatomical function of a, of a transfer guard support for a mortgage and loan. Oh, okay. So, for the nail itself, as it grows out, I do recommend you know putting like a bandy or something to push that nail full down. Um, one thing, the trick that I learned from a colleague of mine is you can buy over the counter lidocaine and put it on because so, I know it's a little uncomfortable as the nail goes out, it can push on it. But I just you know, recommend just put a band-aid on it as it grows out. So this is a, you know, for you to relate to when it's removed the whole toenail. If it's just a side, you probably don't see that issue because the nail, the, the rest of the nail is still there pushing the nail bed down. But if it's the full toenail, I recommend just like a band-aid or even duct tape to push it down and then you know, use a little lidocaine if it's sore. When it comes to the tars uh, metatarsal pads for the neuroma, there are those bumps or neuroma pads underneath. The whole goal for it is to push the distance between your second and, th or excuse me, the third and fourth metatarsals, they put more space to it or take the pressure from the nerve. And that's the whole biomechanic thought process to it. Is that a question? Okay. What do you do with a patient who repeatedly comes to you to twist their ankle and has real swelling and hematoma of the lateral ankle? Yes, for the lateral ankle, if it's a... So those are patients you've already done physical therapy, ankle braces. That's the best for prevention conservatively. You know, surgically there is a procedure called brostrum. It's a lateral ankle stabilizer. That's a shorter, you know, it's a pretty straightforward um, surgery. It takes about three weeks to heal, but conservatively there's nothing because once you stretch that ligament out, um, you got to wear ankle brace all your life. You can do physical therapy to try to overact your perineal tendons um, to try to strengthen it, but you lose that proprioception. So when we know that, so I tell patients, like if you close your eyes and take your finger and pull it back, you're gonna tell me, ow, but when you're ankle, you close your eyes, I keep twisting it, you don't feel the ow. The goal of the surgery is to give you that ow back. So when you pull your ankle sideways, you feel that tug. That's why like taping in the ankle brace, that gives you that skin sensation, whereas you twist your ankle, that tape pulls against your skin, you're like, oh, that's that feeling you see in you, you know, your, your perineal tendons will push you back. But that's a tough one, especially if your ligament lactis laxity all the time and you've tried those, unfortunately you either live with it, wearing braces all the time. Um, you know, younger patients, they do okay with the bracing, but the hard part, especially nowadays, you know, for the gait training or the fall prevention, that's a tough one because I've seen patients, they fall because their ankle's unstable or they're, and the next thing you know, they break their hip. That, that's a tough one. Um, there are some balance braces that I've used. It's really a slick device. I don't have a picture here, but I do in my office. They help them. So, you know, the ones so that the they have a little drop foot, a little bit weaker. It's a kind of an L shape. So here's your ankle behind has two straps. It's real straightforward and it, it's had some good results to give them a little bit better balance. So it's not preventing, protect, it's protecting your ankle, but actually protecting your whole body so you don't fall um, when they're walking. I don't have an ultrasound. You know, I've thought about it um, most of the time. Ultrasounds are tough. For my, re you know, ultrasounds, foreign bodies I'll use them in the, in the OR. So I have a surgery suite that I'll take them to, to for five foreign bodies. But when it comes to tendonitis and tears, sometimes from a, you know, because they're looking for if it's a tear, I like to use the, uh, more, unfortunately, MRI because it gives me a better surgical plan of, you know, how big is the tear. MRI is tough to see that. I use, or ultrasound it is. I use ultrasound mostly for um, foreign body removals. Um, and then if you see for like, you know, some major minor tears, but I don't have an ultrasound in my office. Plus, it's expensive. It's like forty thousand so. dollars. But I use it in the surgery centers. Question. Have you comment on the testimony for the fracture? 
Yeah, so the sesamoid bones, you know, I always get bilateral x-rays because sometimes you're just born with a bipartite sesamoid. So that's just one. And if you do do it, um, it degrees. So if it's really bad, I'll do a fracture boot, you know, limited weight bearing and anti-inflammatories, and then I'll progress them to an, a custom arch support. Most common I'll see are cleated sports. So softballs uh, and soccer are probably the most that I see because they're betting onto it. Um, when it comes to those cleated sports, I recommend so you flip the um, shoe on and make sure there's no cleat right underneath the sesamoid. And other thing, you know, allude to it, people that have the sievers for the kids, flip it around and make sure there's not just one cleat on the heel. Make sure that these like circumferential like four or five cleats because some of the styles of the cleated shoes will just have like three in the back. So just it's like an analogy where you have the bed with you lay on one needle, it hurts, but if you have a million needles, it's okay. It's the same thing. So with the sesamoids, you know, the cleated shoes and in the orthotic, I recommend it's called a reverse Morton's. It offloads it, it takes it away. If that doesn't work, I will do non-weight bearing for four weeks to take, you know, try to take the offloading away from it. If that still doesn't work, I do get an MRI to look at the, uh, the integrity of the bone. Sometimes you can get from multiple traumas or if it is actually a break, um, you can get avascular necrosis and unfortunately you have to take that out. That's a great question because I was asked that yesterday. That was awesome. So the diabetic referred to me is, the biggest thing is when they start to develop neuropathy, is if they can still feel that stem Weinstein, you're okay. Um, so the, usually the, it's the, the numbness that goes first before bad blood flow because generally the statistics show once you get one wound, it's like 50% chance you're going to lose that toe. So the referral from podiatrist is if they can't touch that stem Weinstein, then I would say refer it because you know I have a podiatrist in my office. We'll do custom arch supports and shoes that have a higher toe box to take the pressure away. Because um, the whole goal is to prevent. And, and fortunately, insurance, especially Medicare, will cover a visit to podiatrist three times a year if you have the neuropathy. Because they'll look at it and be like, "Hey, it's cheaper to see somebody three times a year than you getting one sore, get hospitalized, get IV antibiotics, you know, maybe surgery." Um, so the answer to your question is: once they can't feel the stems Weinstein, you know, send them over. I'll set them up. Um, I'll have a, I have a wound care nurse that sends, you know, sees them. They'll get our regimen. If it's really bad neuropathy with peripheral disease, we'll see them three times a year. If it's not, you know, if it's just the neuropathy, but um, they have good blood flow, and you look at them and like, hey, I'm with it. I know I can look on the bottom of your foot twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening, then I'll see them at least once, twice a year. You yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the raisin shoes are a little bit softer on the top. They're nice. I just picked it up because they're the shape of the shoe. But there's other ones too. Um, JY shoes have them too. But the Raven ones, they kind of go out and the top. And if you touch it, it's like a foam feeling on it. So if you have, you know, bunnies and hammer toes that are compressing on it, um, they kind of expand with your feet. Where do you get those? Um, most common. There's a couple specialty stores downtown. I'll get the number, uh, name for you. Other one is buy them online. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mod. All right. Thanks for your time. I like that. Oh, he's welcome. Uh.